I'm very attractive to mosquitoes. So this video is about how I took this photograph of an emperor dragonfly in flight. Now you might think that uh, taking a picture of a dragonfly is quite a straightforward and easy process. Um, a, a dragonfly in flight, and you just point your camera and click and away you go, there's a picture, nice, very nice. But um, my experience was not quite like that and this video I hope will explain to you some of the uh, challenges of taking a photograph like this. Now I'm not saying this photograph is by any means the best photograph of a dragonfly in flight that you've ever seen. But I think it's a good photograph under the circumstances. And hopefully at the end of uh, this video, you'll see what I mean. That no photograph is... I think if, if, you, if you look at your own photographs and think that photograph is, is, is excellent, perfect, whatever, then there's something wrong. And I look at this photograph and I can see things that, are, that I don't like about it. But it's a compromise and it's always, it, you're always striving towards that... Uh, that, that perfect photograph. So, um, you know, it's overexposed, you know, there, there, there's, uh, it's, it's taken in bright light, it's not, maybe it's not quite as sharp as it could be. Um, you know, I had to do quite a bit of post-processing on the colour to, 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 to bring up the, um, the lovely blue and uh, green uh, colour of this insect. But, um, but you know, I, I, it, took, it took a long time to take it and, and, and I was quite, uh, quite happy with the result that I got. So, uh, so let's go and have a look at um, what's involved in taking a picture like this. So the challenge of taking a photograph like this is um, I use the Nikon D500 with a 500mm telephoto lens, 200-500 uh, telephoto lens, super telephoto lens, um, and that is um, a really good wildlife camera. It's got very good autofocus, it's got very good uh, reach, uh, and I think they came out, the D500 came out in about 2016, so it's quite old now, five years old, in technology terms. But it's, but it's still one of the best cameras you can get for autofocus and for, uh, speed of autofocus and, and the ability to uh, lock focus onto fast moving objects. But a dragonfly or any kind of insect is a tiny, um, is a, usually is a, it forms a tiny percentage of your overall frame and the camera's autofocus system struggles uh, when, there's a, when there is a tiny object. The camera's autofocus system doesn't know what it is that you want to photograph, what it is that you, you, you want to focus on. So the camera's autofocus system is confused by other uh, activity in the, in the frame and as you'll see in my, um, my sh some of the shots I'm going to show you, there's an awful lot going on in the background. There are leaves fluttering in the breeze, there are um, reeds uh, moving around. Um, as I swing the camera around, the, uh, you know, there, are, there are different objects, branches and different things that confuse the auto, that form a larger percentage of the frame than, than does this relatively small insect and therefore the autofocus system really on the D500 uh, cannot, cannot really, um, well it cannot capture, lock focus onto an insect in flight, particularly a fast moving insect like the Emperor Dragonfly. So this is an insect that virtually it never stays still, it's always moving and it moves quickly. So this is a real challenge for any camera. I, I do um, you know, watch uh, other other wildlife photographers, and 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 some people are using the um, the Canon R5, which is a more recent camera, or um, the Sony A9 or the Sony A1, uh, even. And I don't know that maybe their autofocus systems are good enough to capture and, and lock onto um, a, a flying insect and keep it in focus. I don't know. Um, you'd have to ask Mark from Camilla and I, or 
kg for you know about his uh, I know he uses the R5 so you'd have to uh, uh, you'd have to speak to them about that but certainly I just w work with the equipment that I've got and the D500 cannot really um, in my experience lock on to an insect so how do you take a sharp picture of an insect in flight like an emperor dragonfly with the with the D500 Nikon D500 so that's the challenge so there are several steps that you need to take in order to get a sharp picture of a, of a dragonfly in flight. One of them, of course, is uh, knowing your subject. And this is true with any wildlife photographer, photography, is knowing your subject. How does it behave? Well, first of all, can, where to find it? What's the habitat, the environment, the time of year, the time of day? All, all of these different things. Where, where, where can you find it? Um, and secondly, what is its behaviour? If you know its behaviour, that can give you some advantages in terms of um, f photographing it and finding the best ways to capture it. Uh, finding the best ways to capture it photographically. So the first thing is behaviour. When we look at the Emperor Dragonfly, as I said, it's a fast-moving. It's a. It's. I think it's Britain's largest um, dragonfly. One of Britain's largest insects, actually. Um, so it's probably about this this big. Um, and uh, it's brightly coloured. Um, it, it's it's a voracious predator. Catches um, flies in flight, um, but it's found over over uh, largely. It's found over ponds. It spends its um, earlier life cycle as a in its larval stages in a in a pond. And it's a voracious predator in, under the water when it, in its um, developmental stages. But and when it emerges from the water. Into a dragon and metamorphosizes into a dragonfly. It continues to be a voracious predator. It's also um, in the dragonfly phase is is also when it uh, reproduces, and it's uh, fiercely territorial. So it uh, identifies a, a, an area um, uh, around or about, uh, over a pond. Um, and defends this territory from other dragonflies and uh, uh, and hunts in that area that, it, that its own territory and in doing so it follows it, often its flight follows if you sit and watch one for a little while you'll see that its flight is often a repetition of a particular route a particular circuit of its of its territory so this little piece of information is the sort of thing that um, in wildlife photography is invaluable because it can give you some uh, give you some advantages in terms of, uh, of um, how to set up your camera where to set it up uh, uh, and even where to focus um, the second thing of course is is knowing your camera and um, which 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 autofocus modes to use which or even whether to use manual focus um, which um, objects it can actually capture, which objects it, it maybe struggles with, um, and how um, how your camera is likely to identify. The camera's got, you think about it from the camera's point of view, um, the camera's got to work out what is the, what is the autofocus is, and you press autofocus, the camera's got to work out what is the subject, what is what is it that you're, you're trying to photograph. If you're using uh, single point autofocus, uh, well, I don't know about you. Maybe you're much better at this than me. But if you if you're using single point autofocus, you've got to get that point on your subject. And with a with a fast moving thing like a dragonfly, I've not been able to. I I cannot get that single point onto the dragonfly um, because it's it's just moving so fast and you're swinging the camera so quickly. I can't do that. So I use area autofocus, um, which is really delegating that the autofocus job to the camera and getting the camera to try and work out what the subject of your picture is and as I said before there's all sorts of distractions which can confuse the autofocus system but there's something that you when you get to know your camera a little bit you can see that uh, some things can give you a little advantage so one of the things I do is is look at where the, uh, the, the sort of distance that the subject is going to be at focus on something at that distance and then, when the when you do hit autofocus, the camera often picks something that's uh, close to that f um, 
focal distance. Uh, and if that's the dragonfly, then the camera might think, oh, he's wants, he wants to photograph on, he wants to photograph this dragonfly. Uh, and so that can, um, that can be a technique that you can use to um, help the, the camera's autofocus system to know what your subject is. So, no, so uh, j just generally though, knowing, knowing the limitations of your camera lens combination and knowing how it works and how it behaves in different situations, I think is, uh, is critical really to, to uh, the more challenging subjects. So one of the other things I think it's important to think about is lighting. Ideally in wildlife photography you want to take pictures not in, uh, you know, on a cloudy day or in, in, in not in a bright sunlit day where there's a lot of harsh light. So you can get around this by uh, going out on a cloudy day or going out early in the morning or in the late evening. But, the, but as with all wildlife photography, there's, there's, there's always a compromise. So you think about the exposure triangle. You've got, you've got shutter speed, you've got aperture, you've got ISO, the speed. All, all um, cameras have, uh, camera sensors have an optimal amount of time in a given situation that they need to make, make the best picture. And you get the camera's base ISO, and usually it's 100 uh, on most cameras. Um, the base ISO pr produces the best image. You can force the camera to make an image in less time than it would ideally like and this way you can overcome some of the challenges of the exposure triangle so if you need to use a very high shutter speed and a, and a small aperture you're letting in lot, much less light so you can compensate that with increasing the ISO but that does of course add a lot of graininess to pictures. So when you think about photographing dragonflies, a moving, a fast moving insect, you're going to need a, a, a very fast shutter speed, probably 2,000 or 3,000th of a second shutter speed to capture the dragonfly in flight, freeze, freeze the motion. Um, but also, if, if you want to use, uh, to, to in, if your camera's autofocus system is struggling to get the insect in focus, you may well want to uh, increase the uh, uh, decrease sorry the aperture make the aperture a bit smaller and this way um, you end up with a larger depth of field which increases your chance of getting the uh, object the subject uh, in focus so you're letting in you're you're, you're letting in less light my uh, camera lens is a 5.6 uh, lens so that's its largest aperture but I was often for these photographs I was often using uh, 6.7 or even f8 um, to, to increase my chances of getting an in-focus shot um, and of course thereby letting in less light. That of course means that the ISO goes up, the pictures end up very grainy. So how do you get around this? Well, my, one of the ways I got around this was to, um, to take my picture, this particular picture in very bright light, in brighter, harsher light than I would otherwise have wanted to take it. But that's the compromise that I used to, to, uh, um, in this image. Um, and um, that's something that I think every photograph, it, to some extent, is a compromise between these different, different elements. Um, you know, the weather, the, 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 um, the subject of your photograph, they don't always uh, cooperate, cooperate perfectly uh, and uh, appear uh, in optimal lighting conditions. If you, if you like that kind of photography, then I'd say go and do studio work <laughs> and, you, and you can control every element there. But in the, in the wild, in the, in, in the natural world, compromises are necessary. The other thing, of course, with um, subjects like dragonflies is that they don't often, on a, on a dull or a cloudy or a, um, uh, uh, in, in perfect lighting conditions, they often they don't fly. <laughs> they just don't. Then you don't see them. So um, it's it's uh, it's warm sunny days where you'll see dragon a lot of dragonflies. So you know that's, this is another consideration to take into account. So lighting and the exposure triangle and reality versus um, the perfect photograph are all elements that you need to uh, to take into account when you're taking a picture like this. One of the other things I would say about taking pictures of uh, flying insects, dra dragonflies in particular, is um, if you've not done it before, um, don't, I would recommend that you don't start with an emperor dragonfly. Um, 
these insects, as I said before, they fly around really fast. Um, they're always on the go, and they never they they will come and rest on a on a reed or something like that. Um, and then, but once they're in the air, they never stop. So they really are uh, one of the more challenging of the dragonflies. If you uh, if you want to start, it might be a good idea to start with something like a ruddy darter or a migrant hawker, as these are large and beautiful um, dragonflies to photograph, but they, um, they pose better in flight. So, uh, for example, here's a picture of a migrant hawker I took last year, which um, is easier to, it still takes a good bit of time to, uh, to, to photograph um, an insect like, insect like this in flight, but they do periodically hover for you know five or six seconds they'll hover in exactly the same spot almost like a kestrel just keeping that same position in the air and that gives you time to get the um, single point autofocus uh, on the insect and, and get a reasonably sharp picture so uh, start off with a migrant hawker or a, a ruddy darter or something like that and then when you've had a a bit of success with those insects, then uh, then go on to the emperor dragonfly, which I've I've all the time I've watched them, <laughs> I've never seen them, I've never seen them stay still long enough to get that single point autofocus on them. So um, that might be a, 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 another approach that you might want to think about. The last thing I'd say is that um, what you need. For for this kind of photography is patience. So you're looking at taking hundreds of pictures to get one that you're reasonably happy with. Um, you're looking at putting in the hours, you're looking at not just putting in the hours, um, trying to capture the, the insect in flight, trying to, to get your sh particular shot, but hours doing different things like looking at the animal's behavior, finding the animal, looking at the anim animal's behavior, looking at the different angles, the different possibilities, which, which um, you know, you're going to be shooting into the sun, you, you know, you're going to have uh, uh, too, too much of a... I mean, one of the other important things, I think, is looking at background and trying to get um, a good background um, to your image as well, so that you've got a nice uh, um, non-distracting non um, background that doesn't take attention away from your, your subject. Um, so there are lots of different, uh, lots of different things you need to be able to, um, to be able to take pictures like this. And I think, if you take all these things into consideration and and, and experiment for yourself, um, I think you'll you'll uh, I think you'll, you'll you'll have a lot of fun. And um, and when you do get a nice picture, you know it's a, it's a good feeling. It's a good uh, sense of achievement. So um, if you've got uh, got a bit of time. <laughs> and the inclination, then I'd, uh, I'd say give it a go and see how you get on. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again next time.